Hello and welcome to a very special edition of AIDS Map Chat. It's our Pride edition and as you may have noticed, I'm all on my own. So it means that I get to say that this is our live broadcast for people living with HIV all around the world. My name's Matthew Hodson. My usual co-host, Susan, can't be with us here today. She's unfortunately unwell, but we do have a fantastic lineup of guests. We have the legendary HIV activist, uh, from New York, he's Peter Staley. He was there with ACT UP and he was one of the co-founders of the Treatment Action Group. We also have a good friend of mine, the wonderful Michelle Ross, who co-founded, or sorry, founded uh, Clinic Q, the transgender sexual health clinic, uh, which is now at King's. And the incredible Mark Thompson, he is with a lot of co-founders. He was the co-founder of Prepster and he's a broadcaster and activist. Great guests. It's a very special Pride edition. I do want to just talk about Susan first of all, because um, Susan and I, you know, we are both people who live very openly with HIV. And I think as a lot of people who live openly with HIV, we sometimes feel the need that we have to be somehow more healthy, better, stronger, because we, by living openly with HIV, we are trying to dispel some of the kind of myths and misinformation about HIV that persist you know, associating HIV with sickness and illness and dying, which in the treatment era, we shouldn't, at least not as a result of HIV infection. But of course, that doesn't mean that we're invulnerable. We are still subject to all of the other conditions which everybody else is subject to. And in some cases, we may be more likely to have those conditions. Nothing magical or mystical or frightening, really, about what's happening with Susan. She's got COVID, as so many people have had over the last couple of years. Um, I know that you will wish her the very best and um, just she needs to know that she has my complete support coming out tonight. It's a braver thing to do. Um, so wish her love and we'll get on with the show, which, as I said, it's very weird doing a monologue, isn't it? Um, it's our Pride edition. So I've been thinking about Pride a bit. And I remembered my first ever Pride march, which was in 1986. Now, back then, if you went on a pride march, there, there weren't like enough hordes of people on the street cheering you on or anything like that. The whole purpose of it was you would march, you would be on a march and just being out there in daylight, in the open, walking through the streets of London, being visible was an incredibly political act. I mean, I'm kind of courageous because so very few people then felt able to be open about being LGBTQ. Things have changed enormously, and part of that change actually arose out of some of the discrimination that we faced. In the UK, we had Section 28 come in. It started its progress through Parliament in 1987. Now, that was a law that was designed to uh, prevent the promotion of homosexuality. It was designed to keep us hidden away from children. And of course, it was the same time that the great UK's HIV campaign with the iceberg and the tombstone and the doom-laden kind of text and, and, and voiceover came out. And of course, those two things became very associated, HIV and gay men and bisexual men in particular at that time. So this whole new piece of legislation was introduced with the idea that they were going to try and keep homosexuality hidden away from younger people or from society as much as possible. And of course, it didn't work because the more they tried to hide us away, the angrier we got and the more visible we got. So by February 1988, I went on a march in Manchester and there were 20,000 people there, about 10 times more than there had been in that Pride March in 1986. And those numbers were then replicated at the Pride marches. And each year, the numbers on these marches got bigger. So now we have like millions of people who throng the streets of London for Pride. And also, I think those lessons about being visible, about being open, about rejecting fear and stigma are so powerful within our gay communities, too. So I think this intersection between LGBTQ activism and HIV activism has been central. And so that's what makes me very excited about the guests we have tonight. Be visible. Be proud. This is how we banish homophobia. This is how we banish transphobia. This is how we banish HIV stigma. Our first guest tonight is knows more about activism than probably anyone else I can think of. He is 
one of the mainstays of ACT UP New York. If you've watched the incredible, and I do recommend it, uh, Oscar-nominated documentary, How to Survive a Plague, you'll be very familiar with him. His name is Peter Staley. Hey, Matthew. Hi, Peter. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Um, good to be in really, London. It, it's good to be in London. It, it, it's so weird because we, we often have guests from all around the world, and usually they come to us from all around the world. But this week, all of our guests are in London because we actually managed to import one, but we're still, <laughs> we're still sort of in separate rooms, you know, different sides of London. Now, yeah. Peter, I, I was reading a, 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 from your old biography the other day, and you said, um, and let me just get this right, you said that when you went to that, um, your first HIV activist meeting, you were found yourself surrounded by HIV positive gay men who demanded to be heard and to live without stigma. And that really resonated with me. I think not least because it felt to me that that's what we're still doing now. What, 35, 40 years later? How, how, how do you think? Do, do you think that's a battle still to be won? Uh, you know, I've seen a bunch of pendulum swings and backlashes over the years. And uh, sometimes those, and we're in one now, obviously. It's remi very reminiscent, uh, very focused on the uh, our our trans uh, family members, and uh, it's very reminiscent of 2004 in the U.S. when uh, President uh, Bush used gay used us as as a target to get reelected uh, around the first steps towards gay marriage, um, and it was useful for them at the time. We saw the Republicans beat the hell out of us, and it was a very scary time. And now they're doing it again, and um, uh, really focusing on, on the trans community. And I, you know, I suspect it's not going to even, just like it didn't work then, eventually, I, I strongly suspect it's not going to work now. And we will see a great deal of progress in the years ahead for trans rights and for the trans community. I, I very much hope so. And I think we're seeing this happening on both sides of the Atlantic. And I think it is, it seems to me, it feels like it's very politically motivated. And unfortunately, exactly. trans lives are just being used as the collateral within yeah. this. I, I, there's no doubt we're seeing some suicides. I mean, in, in Texas, we're seeing families ripped apart, families uh, being charged for doing nothing more than trying to help their children. Um, so it's a disgrace and it affects lives, uh, but we are a community that knows how to fight back, that's for sure, and we'll just keep at it. Now, one of the things that, I, I often, that often strikes me is, just in, in terms of HIV, in the UK, we're, we're, we're doing pretty well in terms of our ability to detect and treat and maintain people virally suppressed. But the, in the US, the treatment cascade isn't going as well as it is here in the UK, despite obviously the US being one of the wealthiest, if not the wealthiest countries in the world. What, what's, what's going wrong? Well, we don't have national health care like you do here. That's a, that's a big part of it. And, and we, got, we got our PrEP rollout wrong. Uh, you know, initially in the UK, you had real problems uh, here as well, uh, where the National Health Service took many years most, in, it, it, it's hard from my perspective to totally blame them. Uh, there was a monopoly involved. Gilead had the drug and the price on it was obscene. And so for a national health care plan to bust its budget for what should be uh, something that is in the preventative price range, like vaccines, uh, only cost uh, 100 to 200 pounds a year. It was, uh, you know, 15,000 15, pounds or more. It was crazy. So um, you finally got generic prep here, and it's now part of the national health plan, and HIV infections crashed. We're trying to do that now in the U.S., but we need a national program that takes generic prep and gets it out to where people are. Um, much like we did with the COVID vaccines, national distribution plans, make it free, make it easy. 
Um, we've convinced the Biden administration to put in, in its budget this year a $10 billion plan to have a national PrEP access program uh, going forward. And now all the activists are scrambling to see if we can get this through Congress. So we have our work cut out for us. But yeah, um, we're behind some Af some countries in sub-Saharan Africa as far as our uh, our treatment cascade in the U.S. It, it's a very... Uh, and the treatment cascade, the, of course, the, is absolutely crucial to prevention because yeah, exactly. because undetectable means untransmittable. When we're on treatment, we can't pass yeah. it on. So it, it, it's, I, I think for me, it's always been that pincer movement. It's like, you know, well, if you're HIV negative, take PrEP. If you're HIV positive, get treated, get un yeah. undetectable, and you won't be able to pass it on. And when those two forces combine, I mean, that's very much what we've seen in the UK is it's been the combination of those forces of right. having a prevention option for everybody. Um, I mean, bottom line, America's very fucked up. We know we all know that <laughs> these days. It's, it's just a mess. <laughs> so what gets you angry these days? Then? Stuff like this. I mean, you know, Stuff like this. Back, backsliding and, and worrying about uh, I never thought in my lifetime I'd have to worry about American democracy, you know, and. So it's a, it's a bit of a scary time, but um, when your back a ba when your back's against a wall and and uh, it feels like the world is crashing in on, in on you, uh, which I certainly felt uh, after my diagnosis in 1985, uh, you have two choices: you could roll up in a ball and curl up in a ball in the corner, or you can fight and. You can even fight even while very pessimistic, and uh, um, that option is better than curling up in a ball. At least you but, you you go out fighting. Well, what I love one of the things I love about your activism, Peter, is, is it, so much of it has had this real sense of humour. I mean, there was the the, the the big giant unrolling of the condom and all of that, mm -hmm. and 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 you did talk about. You said once. I think it was something like you know, the, the, those early years, the, those pre-treatment year, years. Of HIV activism, it was it was fifty percent horror and tragedy, yeah, and it was ten percent inspirational, and it was forty percent laughter and sex. Yes, I mean that's, the, that's kind of the hidden story about ACT UP. But we're the most one of the most sex positive movements in human history, I think, and uh, we had we were hit with a stigma by uh, six years into the crisis where the you know, the politicians on the right thought we should be quarantined and uh, it's just very, very frightening and certainly that we shouldn't have any sex and ACT UP's response was, well, we know condoms work and safe sex work, so we're going to have tons of it and we're going to have, we're going to just do it very openly and in your face and uh, get used to it. We're here, we're queer, get used to it. <laughs> It's our pride edition. I think that's a perfect message to end it on. Peter, it's so great to meet you almost in person for the very first time. It's been a real pleasure to speak with you. Thank you. Me too, Matthew. Thank you for having me on. Now, obviously, we, we, I mean, Peter and I were just talking then about uh, trans communities and some of the challenges which trans communities are facing at the moment. I hope, I really try hard to be a really good ally to trans people. and. A lot of that, for me, comes from a conversation I had with someone many, many years ago. When, and that person was our next guest. It was Michelle. So I was working at Gay Men Fighting AIDS, and Michelle sent me an email, and she said, can we meet up for a chat? And um, she invited me over to the clinic where she was working at the, the time, which is the newly opened Clinic Q. And she sat me down, and she gave me Trans 101. Um, and it changed my life. It literally changed my life because I, mean, I, I just had been kind of ignorant before. And I just got it from that conversation. I just thought, oh, my God, all those things which people said to me as a gay man are like, well, how do you know you're gay or have you tried not being gay? And it's just like, no, this is exactly what trans people experience. So, of course, I related to how it feels to be trans, even though I'm not trans because Michelle Mitch just laid it out and made it so clear and simple. So I'm always grateful to you, Michelle, for that. And I just always want to honor you for, for that because you, you've opened my eyes and you've been such a great friend to me. So I really appreciate you. Now, you, 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 you've been kind of really active in HIV for, 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 for many years. So, so 
because you used to be a terrorist against trust volunteer. Is that right? I started, yeah, in 1988 and wow. um, went straight on to the helpline, more or less, and then on reception, which I loved because it was just that busy and everybody just, man, everybody, a lot of people got involved with almost everything that we were doing. Remember, it was a community response and there was nothing like that response in many ways before that. And, you know, that community response changed things. It changed, you know, I often say this, there was no really sexual health service for gay and bi men that was informed, that wasn't scary, that was by as well the people who were affected by either sexual health and HIV. And, um, and that really set the groundwork for things to develop from there, really. And I, I don't know if people really know that. But, um, sexual health before that was a bit primitive. I'm sorry. I don't mean to offend anyone that was in sexual health all those years ago. But it, it, there, there was That's a lot true. of awareness about it. Sorry. <laughs> 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 yeah, can I just say something? When I invited you to talk, to have a chat with you, I didn't realize how such a lovely person you are and such a friend you would become. And that I'm grateful for. God, does that sound okay? I mean it though. <laughs> oh, oh, well, good. You know, I mean, that's, 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 that's nice. You didn't say, yeah, I thought you were a bit of a twat. So I'm not grateful for that. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, I, Obviously, it's become this thing uh, w within our communities now is that, I mean, I just so believe that we're stronger when we stand together. And, you know, that for me, there is no LGBT without the T, obviously. Um, and there are so many reasons for this, but not least the fact that we're more powerful when we support each other. And there's so much of those those systems of oppression are the same. It just doesn't make sense to me that we wouldn't support each other. Now, do you, has your perception of, of, of kind of, you know, because you were working for THT, which was then mainly, I guess, gay and bisexual men. I mean, does it yeah. feel like things have changed over the years or, or is, is this just like some kind of fringe thing on the side? Are we talking about HIV or you mean? No, I'm like... talking about LGBT communities. Oh yeah, it feels like it's changed. I mean, there was always, I think in the, LGBT plus communities, I think there's always been some aspect of stigma within that from others to others, either racism, you know, from white people or, or you know, from perhaps gay men to lesbians or lesbians to gay men. There's always been this thing that sat there somewhere. But I think we've got through that most of the time when we've got to know each other, when we've come together, as you say, and how we've learned to be stronger by being together. And that phrase sometimes feels like it's overused, but actually, it's not used enough because it's the truth and it sits in a place of truth where it comes from. Because, you know, when you divide us, then you're open to be divided even more, really. Or when you try to divide us, or if you go along with that division, then you're playing into someone's hands. And I think you're right. We're stronger together. Yeah. Now, one of the things, of course, which you did, which is you know, so incredibly powerful, and it's how we know each other. But um, you, you were working within sexual health as a volunteer and you said, well, what's happening for trans people? Who's looking after me? And you just you went out yeah. and you created it. You created Clinic Q. So, so what, how do you create that safe space for trans people to access information, support and services for their sexual health? Well, it's a longish story because, you know, I've been THT for 27 years. And um, as a therapist, psychotherapist with THT, and I've seen a lot of people with HIV as well as trans people. Not many trans people living with HIV, but actually concerned about it as well. And um, I knew that there was nothing focused on trans people, no information, really. There was some stuff in the States, and I made contact with um, a woman called Joanne Keatley, who is a fantastic friend of mine, and um, I'm a director at IOGT, which is um, a global network of trans people responding to the HIV crisis that still is around <clears throat> in many countries um, around the world. And so um, how do you set something up? Well, we did a, a little survey, a little survey with young queer people, and it was about about trans people and um, what was your experience of sexual health? What was it like? We kind of knew the message we got back, but it was pretty devastating, pretty um, 
soul destroying in some ways because people didn't want to go back to those services, didn't want, didn't trust them, didn't test for HIV, didn't test for any other STIs. And um, so that's where the inspiration came from. And the idea that I had for Clinic Q, it wasn't called Clinic Q there, then, it was a something, a space where people could come and talk about these very issues and then feed into some sexual health services or well-being service. Because I think we look at the whole thing, person, each person as an aspect of, of, of well, wellness, as sexual health and wellness. So, um, so that's where it came from. And then it was working how, how that would look, what that would be like. And when we first opened Clinic Q 2010, we were very quiet and we planned to go out to the community. Well, first of all, why should people trust us saying, yeah, come and have, you know, have your bits looked at, you know, for sexual health and talk to us about your intimate things that you might not speak to anybody else about. Come and have a smear with us when that's something that can be really intrusive for many people. And um, so just check us out, see who we are, get to know who we are. You don't have to have a service, have a cup of tea. And, um, and they kept coming and they kept coming back. And we kept going out and we kept, I mean, then we held a conference a year later and it was packed out the door, people sitting on the floor on tables at the back and didn't want to leave. You know, usually at conferences, it's like, I want to get away early. The interesting stuff has been done, but these people just didn't want to go. And we've had seven conferences since then and each one is packed. Uh, and, well, right. what, so what, one thing when I announced that you were going to be on the show, um, uh, Shan Doxy said, oh, if Michelle's going to be on the show, can you ask her how does she maintain that Hollywood glamour? Now, I mean, I think it's the question on everyone's lips, but I don't think we had the, the, the time because, I mean, I think the answer is, of course, natural beauty anyway. Um, <laughs> no, but, of course, the important, <laughs> the important <laughs> element is, you know, kind of often it's, it's, it's getting those faces out there and saying, yeah, well, actually, if you come to this clinic, you will be met by people who will have some commonality of experience. And I think yeah. that's so important. That visibility is so important. And I'm just going to big up this one achievement, which is shared between you and the other trans sexual health clinics across the UK. But when we had that PrEP rollout program, it was the, 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 the trial, um, we got like a higher proportion of trans women than was seen in any other PrEP demonstration trials around the world. And it was real testimony to the work that you, you have done. And, um... Yeah, that was so important. Really, PrEP is, is a, as you know, is massively important, as well as you equals you in all communities. And, you know, we worked really hard to bring trans people an awareness of PrEP, how it didn't necessarily uh, interfere with your hormone treatments. It didn't contradict, you know, any, any contraindications of that. And I think coming from a place of trust, when we spoke about that, you mentioned the other clinics, when they, when people had a trust in those words, in those what we were saying, um, I think it helped. And as you said, people came uh, for PrEP and still do. And um, it's really important. There is one thing I do want to say, how we really need to reach communities who are not reaching around PrEP. As you know, we still need to do a lot of work around that. I haven't got the answer there. Hopefully our next guest will have the answers to that because our next guest is Mark Thompson, who is one of the co-founders of Team Prepster. That Thank is you. the smoothest segue I've ever done. I feel so proud of really you right now. <laughs> Hello, good evening. <laughs> good evening, Mark. How are you? I'm good. I'm, I'm in Brixton, you know, in uh, in London. So, you know, just down the road. But yeah, I'm really, really well. Thank you, Matthew. And thank you for inviting me. This is uh, really exciting. If, if, if I didn't throw like a gay man, I could probably throw a stone and hit you. But um, unfortunately, yeah, I'm exactly. gay, so <laughs> I can't throw. <laughs> um, now, Mark, you you actually diagnosed the same year as Peter Staley. Um, I believe you were diagnosed in 1985. Uh, like... 1986. 1986. All oh, right. Yeah. I, I mean, I mean, obviously, Peter was young, but you were like really young when you were diagnosed. Mm. I mean, can you share how that felt? Yeah, I mean, I I just turned seventeen and a bit, and I'd been out for just a year and had a couple of partners, and so um, a, a HIV diagnosis was really not on my cards. It was not on my plan, so I was completely stunned and surprised by it, and it, the, the 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 rug came from under my feet, and it completely changed my life. 
But what you've done with that, I, I mean, and it may have even been you who said this, that there's that thing about be the role model you needed as a young person. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, I mean, and I mean, I'm a white gay man, you know, so I mean, you know, it was, I think a lot of things were easier for me because even though I would say, oh God, I was hardly any role models for me. When we started to have gay role models, they were mainly white, but you're a yeah. black gay man. Well, you know, it's an interesting one about the role model because I always say that I had my dad and my grandfather and my uncles and all these other men around me, strong Jamaican men that gave me a real good sense of who I needed to be in the world as a black man. That was really important. I didn't have a lot of gay role models around me, but at the time that didn't feel too important. But certainly in those first few years of my diagnosis, it was an incredibly isolating time because I knew other gay men who had HIV. I didn't know anybody who was black. But the other really important thing, uh, Matthew, is I didn't know any young people. And I didn't know many people who were who were well. A lot of people I knew were, 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 were develop, developing from blown AIDS, becoming really unwell, and I wasn't. So there was all, you mentioned intersections. So there was all these intersections which made me feel incredibly alone. And just picking up on what Michelle said was that that then motivated me to go and create stuff to meet my needs because there was no services available for young black queer men at the time. So that's when I started Big Up and my career has just always been about build it because nobody else is going to. And once you do, they'll come. And I think that's kind of proven for me. You still there? I mean, what? So I, I, I don't know if you froze for anybody else. You just froze for me just then at the end of that response. So I'm. Um, um, yeah. But I, I think you kind of finished. Um, I, I, I do know. I, I, I know a lot of young kind of black activists. You know, people like Phil Samba, for example. And you know, they just refer to you as the mentor, the Jedi master. Um, <laughs> and I think, and I think it's, I think it's wonderful because actually it is that kind of a, a gay men fighting AIDS. We used to have this thing of you know, kind of shag one nag one but you know there is that almost it's like you're you're, you're leaving a trail an increasing a pyramid of people who come after you and and this is going to make it you know we we, we, we blaze that trail to make it easier for those who come after I, I want to ask you about the question which Michelle raised because I mean obviously there are communities which are accessing prep not at the rate which we would want them yeah. to but there's I mean there's also still real struggles. I mean, you've done phenomenal work with Prepster to get Prep access, but why are why is it that people still aren't able to access Prep, even in the UK when it's now on NHS? You know, I think Matthew. I mean, like all of these things, as we've known in HIV prevention for 30, 40 years, it's never as easy as some simple answer. And so there are complex issues to do with people's own lives as individuals. Where do they see themselves? How do they see risk? And when I talk about my own HIV diagnosis, I always say, ask me why I got HIV. And I got HIV because I didn't think it affected me. I didn't have access to resources and I didn't know how to negotiate safer sex with my partner. And I think those factors still remain the same for young queers of colour, young migrants of colour, so young migrant queers as well. So there are those things around us as individuals, but then there's the systemic things which are in place, those barriers which prevent us. So our clinics operate in particular ways which may not be as welcoming to young queer communities of colour. So I think those are the sort of things that we need to address is the individual need, but also the systemic stuff. And the work that we've done collectively in the UK at AIDS, MAP, PrEPS, THD, Clinic Q, Clinic T, has been amazing at challenging those systemic failures which prevent people accessing testing, treatment and PrEP. Absolutely. I can't believe it. We've run out of time already. Mark has been a real joy. To, I know it goes so fast, doesn't it? It's, it's been a joy to have you on the show. Thank you so much. Thanks for inviting me. So, as I said, that's all we've got time for. It's been really wonderful to have our guests, all of whom just blaze trails. And, and, and it's so important to have that visibility, I think, you know, in terms of you know, people with, living with HIV, uh, people of colour, trans people, and have them show what what we can all achieve. Um, this, oh my God, 
It's the last episode, um, and I can't bear it that I'm doing it without Susan. It's the last episode of this season. We will be back for one more episode this year. It will be a very special episode. Watch out for details of that soon. Um, I want to send my wishes to Susan, and I want to thank uh, our guests, Marshall and Peter, uh, our sponsors, Theratech and Once Per Oasis. I want to thank the gorgeous Cameron and Andrew at Dis and all the crew at Disruptive for their support, and I look forward to seeing you very soon. Take care.